afternoon everybody. We are today here on a very special occasion which is the anniversary of the 1965 war. And who better than a person who was there? He was in the Navy, got commissioned five years prior in the year 1960 and then you know had everything fresh and everything live to talk about a war which India takes pride in winning. Welcome, Commodore Ranjit Rai. It's so wonderful to have you on ADO's chat room. And sir, you were there, five years commissioned. What was it like? Well, it's a pleasure to be in, in the museum to talk about the 1965 war because I'm one of those few who were commissioned in 1960. So we saw it all live. Well, we must situate what India went through. 1962, the Indochina War had put our morale down. Uh, we were not sure of what the future would be. America was arming Pakistan. And therefore, Ayub Khan took this decision that he was going to do the second war of Kashmir. So there was there were skirmishes in the Kutch area. The army, the border security forces, and the, the army was handling it quite well, we thought. Then there was a ceasefire, an agreement with the World Bank and therefore everything looked very peaceful. What was it in the Indian Navy? We did not know much of what's going on. Operation Gibraltar was going on sending people into Kashmir. The army was handling it again. But if I remember correctly, the Indian fleet was coming back near Kutch's coast and we thought they will help in some way. It did not happen. Vikrant was in refit. Young officers like me were waiting to see what is this all about. Yes, on 1st September, the army, the General Chaudhary, ran to the Minister of Defence, Defence Minister Jagdiva Ram, and he said to him, over the, said to him, we need the Air Force. Shamb is under attack. And therefore, magnificently, we heard, a Chief Marshal Arjun Singh flew vampires that very evening, within six hours, a war out, readiness that was for the Air Force. Without warning for a war, war had begun. The 17-day war had begun. And therefore, vampires were shot down. That's history. And the Navy said, now we must go in. There was a cabinet meeting, and Joint Secretary Sarin, who later became on the Defense Secretary, made a note to Edward Soman, the Navy will not operate beyond Port Bandar. You are not to take on any action. Why? Intelligence reported PNS Ghazi. We had no submarines. Pakistan had PNS Ghazi, a tense submarine. So, Prime Minister Shastri and the cabinet had no idea how to use the Navy. They used the Air Force because they were a little worried. But well, why bring in the Navy? And therefore, we were disappointed. And I must say before you ask me any question, it's in Admiral Soman's book. I was his flag lieutenant. He had told us all about it. He went to see the defense minister. The defense minister took the file, initial hit. Five days of war were over. Navy was not involved. Five days were over. He said, no, I must go and see the prime minister. He went and saw Lal Bahadur Shastri, who said to him, it's a cabinet decision. Cabinet notes are what the government orders. But he said, I'd like to meet the President of India. And those famous words of Lal Bahadur Shastri, there is no need for you to meet him. So the Navy, unfortunately, uh, you're taking the trouble to come to the museum to ask you, we did not take part in the 1965 war, but we were all ready for it. We were itching. The Brahmaputras were ready. The bees were ready. The ships were ready. My saw was ready. Yes, Vikrant was in refit. And so I was also ready that I might get a chance to be on a ship and go and take part in the war. But the Navy did not take part. Yes, five ships of Pakistan came at high speed to hit Dwarka. They shelled Dwarka. Nothing but a cow was killed. But they went and reported in the Pakistan media, we have uh, sunk Ramputra and we have shelled Dwarka. And I find many books have been written about the 1965 war. I won't name them. They have not mentioned much or anything about the Indian Navy not taking part. Yes, absolutely, sir. But the truth remains 
that you had a good navy. Let's say you, uh, we didn't have a submarine, Pakistan had one, but we did have a very good navy. Now, after 57 years, this geopolitical situation is quite similar. And uh, in such a situation, sir, where do you find the Navy has moved from to the Navy of today, where we have, uh, you know, aircraft carriers, which are just state of the art. We've got the best of everything. So now in the similar geopolitical conditions, if something happens, where do we stand? Where, where does Navy's role stand? Now? Well, the succinct answer about 65 is, we were ready. We had anti-submarine ships, the Kukhe class, we had Brahmaputras, we had Talwars. We had exercised with Royal Navy submarines. We could have taken on Ghazi, which we did in 1971. Yes. Uh, but then the confidence of the government was not there. Today, it is leaps and bounds ahead. We have made our own sonars, thanks to Paul Raj, naval officer. We have made our own radars, thanks to Indra and Tatas. Yes, we are still importing radars. Wesi has made communication system with Bharat Electronics. ECIL has made equipment. Uh, the Lhasa and Tubro uh, have done a strategic project. They don't say it, but it's the Ariane in a public-private partnership. So for the Indian Ocean region, which has got choke points, it's our region. How dare everybody come through to the 8 degree channel or the Malacca Straits or the Babel of Manda or Suez. Yes, so we are strong enough. The Navy has got very able leadership. Today's leadership, you cannot rise high unless you're a seagoing man. In the old days of, you know, being a good staff officer and rising is not there. You have to have fighting ability. And therefore, I can say with some confidence, Indian Ocean, the in India is in very safe hands. We are the net security provider. Ships are powerful, and you can see some of them in models in the museum. The private sector is moving ahead, helping SMEs. Just two torpedo uh, support vessels, diving support vessels, who are commissioned by Mrs. Yes. Hari Kumar. Yes. And they're big vessels. In my time, ships were not that big. Right. So, but there you are. But beyond the Indian Ocean, Quad wants us in, South China Sea. We will maintain freedom of navigation. But I don't think deployment in those long areas uh, is still a feasible sign that the government of India gives more emphasis for more platforms, more superstructure and so infrastructure so that we can go beyond what we are today. We need tankers for that. We need a little bigger aviation with PHIs. So nothing to worry. Indian Ocean with Indian Navy is in much better shape than 65 or 71 is my reading having been through that whole period. Very true, sir. And uh, when we continue with this, sir, we have two very major mantras of the government of India to which Navy has been the half of We have the Make in India and the Atma Nirbhar Bharat. May Navy has always been doing it. And it's been a long, uh, it's a long story, except for the aircraft carrier and some other very major strategic requirements. Navy started the process. Army and Air Force uh, are still in the process of following. So with that, sir, where does Navy stand when it comes to fulfilling the Make in India plan? Well, the Aviation Defense Universe has been reporting. We built our Navy brought 14 ships from England, whether it was Mysore, Delhi, or uh, Vikrant, or Brahmaputra and the Kokri and the Talwar class. Officers and men stood by them. They knew how to build ships. So when they came back, they said, we have to build our own. So we were way ahead of the army, which is still struggling uh, with the uh, tank and the rifle. Uh, they are still, our force are still struggling and coming up online with the LCA, which Navy helped them. The Navy helped them with our LCA, making it lighter, giving it ailerons. Mm -hmm. So we are well ahead, well, not boasting, not boasting. But because of our pedigree and what we learned from the Royal Navy, the powerful Royal Navy, then we went to the Soviet Navy. And you know what? I was liaison officer to Admiral Goshkov. He looked at Nilgiri. I was very proud of it. And he said, Gade weapons, where are the weapons? Then the armament has come, the Brahmas, 
the AK-630, the rocket launchers RBU-2000. So he put power into the Indian Navy. Then we went to the American Navy, and American Navy is now the number one Navy in the world. So we got their four ops, forward operating procedures. We did exercises, Konkan, Garuda, Malabars. So definitely, without boasting, as far as exposure on maritime affairs, on maritime exercises, on maritime weapons, like the Brahmos, which is now going to go into the Zircon era, and has not failed. Not a single Brahmos has failed. Urans and clubs have also not failed. So therefore, oh, we are on our way. But India has to have a more maritime outlook to our approach in the century ahead and this century, because it's going to be more maritime. And uh, so keeping this in mind, uh, what basically would, uh, you know, our audience would like to know also from you is that uh, India has a very strong Navy, yes. But uh, what is the level of the perception management Navy is doing for, uh, you know, giving the world a, f a fact, you know, which is there, that we are here and beware when you enter the region. Which is because keep, keeping in mind China, keeping in mind, you know, we do have a lot of uh, 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 adversary navies, which are there uh, not uh, keeping in mind that they are there. And when we enter the Indian Ocean or any other oceans, so where does this perception management come in? Where we have been lacking and the others have not? A very good point. Perception management is the 21st century. Uh, we have a very strong leader. The leader comes from Gujarat and therefore he understands maritime issues. He has other challenges, but he has let emphasis flow on the Navy. And therefore, Prime Minister Mandel, the body needs to be congratulated. Perception management means you are to show what you are able to do. Look, the whole world is looking at us to join the Quad more aggressively, to trade with us more aggressively. But we have the fear of China and its partnership with Pakistan. So we cannot avoid that, which the army after Ladakh cannot brush it away. The Air Force is very powerful. It is a strategic Air Force. And if there is coordination between the Air Force and Army, as we saw in Ladakh, we are very powerful. There has to be coordination, not perception management, actual coordination between the Indian Air Force, its assets, the Indian Navy and its asset called the Air, Sea, Maritime War Doctrine. Until uh, we have a CDS who can actually get everybody together, in the present circumstances, it's very difficult. So each service is doing its own perception management. In between comes the private sector, which is trying to walk in and compete with the public sector. So the public gets confused with what perception management the media presents and ADU also presents. <laughs> right, sir. And uh, before we wrap up, sir, the last thing which I wanted to ask you was that uh, in these 57 years since the 65 war, because today is the day we are commemorating it, uh, the Navy, as you said, has gone ahead by leaps and bounds. Now, does that also mean that there is an advancement in skill which also has gone ahead by leaps and bounds? Because skill development is something which is required and uh, normally no one talks about it. So we'd like to understand that how is skill being developed apart from the staff colleges of the world. You know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the sailor level, the technical level uh, of skill management. Well, again, I don't think the Navy has explained it well. The Navy lives on training. We have a cadre of officers who do long training. I did five years before I was allowed to stand on the bridge from NDA and from cadet and midshipman time to sub lieutenant time. We competed to get seniority. So officer cadre then does specialization. The technical cadre, all of them are brilliant. And they go and do MTECs in IIPs, get admission in naval life subjects. And finally, you did ask about sailors. Two things happen. We have an artificer class. And that artificer class is semi-engineers. They work with their hands, open an engine and put it back. 
So the combination of the officer, management, artificer, the, look at the ships, they are running around the world, no breakdowns, touch wood. And that is what I saw with steam engines, you had breakdowns, mm -hmm. of course we repaired it, but a ship got delayed. And finally, look at the woman power that has entered the Navy. Women are flying P-8Is, an observer lady I met, she had observer wings. I asked her which helicopter she flew because I'm a navigator and I know. She said, no, sir, I'm on P-8I with 1,000 hours. You know, that's the Navy today. Girls, seven women have been round the world in 267 days. My time, it, it looked impossible, but the women are doing it. So, Nari Shakti. Technical training, and of course, we must admit the army is under pressure, so young officers immediately go on to the LOC mm. and out to Ladakh with not too much background except loyalty to its regiment. Mm. And the regimental officers train them. We don't have that system, we don't have it. We have to train ourselves before we can stand on the bridge, and the captain can sleep while I'm commanding a ship at midnight. Mm. So, nothing to worry. Navy, as far as training is concerned, is very, very adamant that it does perfect training before the man goes to sea. Thank you so much, sir. It was wonderful having you in our chat room. And, you know, I think whenever we speak, my ultimate conclusion always is that I've learned so much which I didn't know. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for being with us. Pleasure for coming to my museum for this. <laughs>